Welcome to this PowerShell Conference EU session, um, DSC is Dead, by Michael Green and myself. Hi, Michael. Hello. Good to see everybody. Uh, thank you for the sponsors to make uh, this virtual PowerShell Conference EU 2020. Uh, that wouldn't be possible without you, and hopefully we'll see you next year in 2021, physically. Um, so today, the main thing we want you to take away uh, from this session is to understand the current situations around DSC, uh, what it is within the PowerShell ecosystem, and what is available now, and what's coming soon as well. Um, we know there are many misunderstandings and some things have changed in the past 12 months and you may not uh, have followed and maybe you're new to PowerShell and you don't know about DSC or you don't know much about DSC and or where it fits for as you said. So when DSC was released, uh, it was the new shiny, shiny thing everyone was excited about and uh, what happened since then. And I believe DSC is slightly misunderstood as it regroups different practices and implements different concepts, sometimes categorized under DevOps or infrastructure as code. Uh, so I think it would be worth uh, clarifying a bit some of those concepts and, and see if it's relevant to you. Uh, from there, we will introduce the DSC community and explain uh, what it's, how it started, uh, what it does now, and how you can find us, and um, what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and um, uh, how it can be useful to you. Uh, finally, we'll look into the future of Azure Policy Guest Configuration and invoke DSC resource with PowerShell 7. Um, so, Michael, can you tell us what your role is? Yeah, I'm the principal program manager uh, in Microsoft Azure Management Services, aligned to configuration management. Uh, so if, they, if there is a server running in Azure or connected to Azure via Arc, which we'll talk about soon, uh, and we need to configure it, that is my job, is to figure out our strategy for how we make that easy. And I'm a consultant in uh, cloud and automation, cloud and, and on-prem automation, I would say. And I'm not working for Microsoft as a permanent employee, but uh, I try to work with them as much as I can. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with, okay, we st at the beginning of time for the Windows automators, um, we started to adopt PowerShell. So I wanted to have a quick demo about what we're doing, something we're doing regularly with PowerShell and how people automate stuff. So I'm going to show you the quick demo first. Pose, dramatic pose for introducing the demo later. I'll go back in. So in the video, we've seen a few principles. Um, whether you're doing a one-off change in a shell or you're writing a script, you will follow a similar pattern. You will get some information first uh, as data. You will put that into variables, whether you're reading, you're reading it from file or you're getting into your script at the top of your script or in your shell. Same principle, you're getting some configuration data. Um, then you need to manage the context of what you're running. So you, if the folder doesn't exist, but you want to set the SEL, you will first create the folder. And uh, from there, you will get the SELs that are assigned to the folder. So that's managing the context of your script. And if you want to do something about it, you will make sure it's not already set. So you will test first if it's needed to do anything, to go any further in your script. And when you've got this, what you're doing is um, you will try to set what is missing. If you find out that the account doesn't have the access you want, you will do the set. But when you've done this, you want to make sure everything's applied properly. So you will probably validate in the end by just checking again if it's really applied. So that's the rough principle of what you're doing in PowerShell. Uh, you have functions, scripts, and modules. And you, PowerShell lets you compose them and configure and customize your system by using imperative programming. You just make, uh, you, you describe computation statements, and they change your system state. Um, but the problem is that leaves you handling the context, the change, and the validation. So if you want to have a bit more abstraction, you need to abstract those commands into higher levels of commands. 
Um, Which usually happens as parameters, like script parameters, right? right. Like whatever happens, like if the expert goes and writes the scripts and it's this big imperative script logic. Uh, which just means it's line by line going through and doing things and sort of a, a structure that the author came up with that's not standardized across their team. And then they want to make it easy for somebody to manipulate that without having to go change code. So they take parameter input and feed that into variables and the scripts. Exactly. And then a function is calling another function. You need to go deeper and deeper. And that's good because that helps you doing the abstraction. Uh, the problem is, as you said, not everyone has the same standards. And uh, then you may have different approaches to the same principle. Um, in, the decade, the, in the decade actually leading to 2012, uh, the Unix and Linux ecosystem uh, had a lot of success from a management perspective with uh, CF Engine, Puppet, Chef, uh, because they applied a slightly different principle. Uh, at that time, uh, they had already a lot of uh, scripters uh, for Unix and Linux, um, but uh, they started doing a different approach to uh, managing nodes. And although um, these tools were really uh, getting more mature, I would say, in the, uh, 2012, uh, the Parachute community was relatively young and there was a huge gap between the Windows ecosystem and the Linux ecosystem. So there was no interoperability. Inter ah, sorry, can't, read, can't say that. Interoperability between the two. Sorry. Um, the Parachute team was trying to enable more Windows sysadmins in more scenarios, thought that Windows needed to be on the configuration management train. And PowerShell was the right place to deliver that. So at that time, they created a PowerShell desired state configuration. So what is DSC? Um, DSC is a language where you describe the components and the state you want each of which each components to look like and um, to eventually converge. So in this case, I want to make sure the uh, my ACL is set properly on the folder on this path. So if you look there, um, the file doesn't exist, the folder doesn't exist yet. So I want to make sure my configuration also add um, this folder. So for that, I will use the file DSC resource and I will uh, make sure my test ACL, oops, sorry, my test ACL folder exists. And I will make sure I have the right property. So I want to make sure it exists. So it's present um, at the destination, which is its path. And that should just be this. And I want also to make sure it not create, it doesn't create a file, but it creates a directory and finally if the parent folder doesn't exist i want to make sure it's there Anyways, so i've defined that i wanted to have a folder to be created there on that the SGLs of this folder are also set according to this so this you need to have the folder before you can uh, set the ACL and I want to make sure obvious so I will use depends on and then depends on um, on my file resource test ACL instance which is there so there we are and on this one I can also add the ensure is present as well just to be extra I'm sorry just to make sure it's extra uh, explicit so this is a configuration for uh, this lo for localhost. So if I run in anything, this will be localhost. So it's going to be on this computer. And I can now run this bit, which is, uh, this is the function I've created there. And that will just compile the configuration into a MOF, which is a serialized version of uh, this compilation, just to make sure uh, just to just to create the compilation and then I can execute it on whatever node I want. So I will just run the selection. And this, so I have a warning because I haven't imported the resource I'm using here, but I only imported the file system DSC. This is a built-in resource, so that's why it's allowed. Uh, it's just not a, a good practice to do so, but for the example, it's okay. So now that I've created this MOF, 
and I've put that into my muff variable, you can see I have a new file created in muff. So let me just uh, show you now. So within this folder, PS config, I only have the configuration one. I haven't applied the configuration yet. So that's going to be what this line does. It tells my agent um, in this configuration folder, there's your there's your uh, configuration definition, your MOF file. Please apply it now. And then when I run this on uh, uh, VS Code, VS Code is running as my normal user account. So uh, it's telling me you have an access denied a code, um, error because I don't have access to the WMI service, which is uh, what interface with um, uh, with the uh, local configuration manager, which is the service, the agent, if you want running. So I need to run this as my admin account. So this is my uh, this is a Windows terminal running as my admin account. Um, this is running PowerShell 5.1. And in this folder, oops, sorry. In this folder, I have my configuration folder and I will run the same thing. I know we can see it's actually very fast. It is running my DSC configuration and you can see the LCM, which is the agent I was talking about. Um, when you run the verbals and wait, it will tell you, well, I'm running the first uh, file uh, test ACL resource and then I will run the second one um, the my ACL and it will set everything it will test and set it and then set the resource so now I can go back here and I can look at my test ACL oh sorry it actually exists so if I just do this you will see it's there and it's created the folder so if we now do a get SEL on the test SEL folder and what I really care about is the access uh, property and you can see that again I've created the folder and I've said the right things so this is how DSC works when you tell it directly this is the configuration you want you create a file which is documenting whatever you want to do and then you just apply that file and it will converge for you so this is the very basics of dsc so behind this the resources i'm using are still um are still a piece of code with imperatives but it's done for you to some extent and um, you can actually find the source code for this one uh, which is on github you can find it on your system obviously but we can also show you the File system DSC resource in the community, and then you can see you have information about the file system DSC resource, and you have access to the code here. The source code is there, and I can go directly in the DSC resource file. The PSM1 is actually the imperative code similar to what you've seen, which is running. So let me close that, and that might be a bit small, but that's the ID. There we go, when it's bigger. DSC community on GitHub and find DSC, file system DSC resource. In this, um, so in this declaration, you've seen that um, what's really important, the core information is the data that you want to provide and you want to, your component to be in. Um, so you declare the state you want to converge to, and then you get your node to get to that state. You say, hey, do this for me. And when you write a declarative document like this, you, it, you don't have to go through the file to understand uh, what it does. You say, this is the expected uh, state. You don't really care anymore about how you get to that state. So the documentation, uh, the, the script with the, the DSC configuration is a documentation of what you expect your system to be. And then the system, which is your uh, agent, for instance, uh, converge to that system for you. So behind the declaration of each component, you still need a piece of code to do the work. You still need to run the commands that you've seen or that you would have written yourself. The difference is you hand that data to another, uh, that piece of code, and this data will enact this change. So this piece of code still needs to manage the context, the testing, the setting Hi. that you've seen, but it's handed over to that piece of code. So it's an abstraction layer. And um, 
that piece of code in DSC is called the DSC resource. Uh, in Chef, it's called a resource. In Puppet, it's a module. In Ansible, I believe it's also a module. Um, it should be a small change, so an atomic change for a very specific component, the resource. And it should be a dependent, which means you should be able to run it many times and always uh, it should always converge to the same stage for that component. Each of those resources create a language together which uh, you can describe your system with. And that is a DSL, so um, a domain-specific language, which for each component, like this one is a file access rule, and you can describe all the file access rules of your system that you expect to be. And if you don't like writing MOF, and and especially if we, once you've got the MOF compiled, sometimes people have some issues. I just wanted to give you a quick yeah. nugget to find a way to pass it. Um, and you can just run this. I'm going to show you the, the demo very quickly, just to pass an existing MOF you compiled and get back an object and you can uh, do something with it if you want to. So this is a very quick demo of a one-liner, which is how do, you, how do you, how can you pass a MOF once it's, it's compiled? So you've seen on the previous demo, we compiled a MOF, which is available into my MOF variable. So I'm just going to run this and uh, run selection. Thank you. And you can see that this is some text, which is not very easy to understand when you look at it and if you want to start passing it with regex it might be a bit tricky or a bit annoying so the other thing you can do and so make sure you have the full path and let me run that selection so this is the full path of the moth which can actually open it so you see the content here and you want to use this uh, method, this static method to do this. So if you look at the static method, it's got uh, the signature here. So you want to have a path, which is a string, and then or on the, in this case, you want also to um, have this integer value for the schema validation option. And the magic number is not 42, the magic number is four. And that means it will not do any check. So if I run this, so that means it will pass. And I will uh, execute like this, run the selection. And then you can see it actually passed uh, my MOF file. So I can actually store that into a variable. There you go. I will run this again, run the selection. And then if I do passed, I will have access to my different properties, which might be an array actually. So if I do this, and then you can see that was the first element I passed on my file, which is my um, file uh, test this here resource, which creates the directory of the scene in the parameters. And you've got a bit more information about it, where the source, when it was compiled and things like this. So I can also do the second element is my ACL one. So this is how you would pass uh, an existing MOF if you ever need to. You prob you may not need to, in the most basic use case, you don't need to, but if you want to compare and validate something, then you can quickly do it with this line. Okay, so, but is it DevOps? Or is it infrastructure as code? I can hear some people asking, asking these questions. So let's go back a bit and I'll explain the concept. And um, we have special language now, which can describe each of our components and how we want them to be once they have converged to the desired state. Uh, when we look at this document, um, we don't have to know the details about the comments being called. They, they, they're still the same PowerShell, there's still PowerShell being invoked uh, behind, but you have a higher level overview of what is going on. Uh, someone else has done the actual work of, maybe it's you in, at another time, but someone else that has created um, the actual resource to, to do the change. But when you describe your infrastructure, you're not just running scripts uh, one after another, you describe the inputs if you want, all the configuration data for that, um, for your system. So our description of the system is elevated to a higher level than uh, it can be with imperative scripts. And those scripts still exist. If you really need to, want, uh, to if you really need to troubleshoot something, you can go and look at the source code. 
But by having this higher level of control over the system, it makes it easier to scale its management. Uh, by changing the definition, we can ensure that it's, um, whatever is defined, whatever is configured with that policy you created, if you update that policy, it will reconverge to that state again. So you don't have, even if you have a moving target, every time you change and you redeploy this new change, you will update the existing system and every new system created based on that policy, based on that definition, will also have the same uh, configuration. So you have much more consistencies across your estate about uh, the configurations of your nodes. And by having a broader field of vision, we spot similarities and differences between uh, between nodes. So we can either correct them or maybe create um, uh, different blocks. So we can compose blocks in DSC, it's called composites, or sometimes you just want to create a role, and then you say, hey, this server A looks a lot like this server B. So probably they should be of the same role. Maybe they're both the SQL server role. So we create that SQL server role, and we apply that role over these uh, two nodes. And you don't have to think about it because they will have the same configuration. It makes it easier to manage when you have 10 of those. You don't have to have to manage the individual instances anymore. You manage the role of them. And since the declaration is just some text file, so I, it's probably like a PowerShell script, it's still text, or you can actually, you don't need to be PowerShell. It can be a YAML definition because what's really important is the data that you provide to those things. And, and some of the logic will be in the composites, obviously. Um, but since it's just text, we can, and we should, and we must put that into source control. And then we benefit from the collaboration around source control. So we put that into Git, and then we can all collaborate into that data. And we have traceability of the changes, and we have auditing and accountability. So by having the right workflow, once it's in Git, we can improve the collaboration. We enable self-service. The one who wants to make a small modification, let's say changing a path, they don't need to be experts in PowerShell. They can just change some data, especially if it's YAML or JSON or something. You just need to be tech savvy enough to understand the format. And then you can just submit a pull request and say, hey, I would like to change this path because it should be there. And um, that helps people. Uh, first of all, it's some kind of self-service. It's not a nice GUI interface, so it's not for everyone, but that means it's easier for, to get people to directly submit a change and you don't have to just put a ticket and then someone will have to process the ticket along with everything else. If you just create a pull request, people can just approve when you, they're happy with your change and that can just go straight to production after testing and things like this. So we ensure we can ensure expert control by enforcing code reviews. So let's say Michael wants to change the MTFS permissions on a folder and says, well, I want to change this. And I'm saying, mm, maybe I should be careful about this. So um, he's going to say, hey, I just want to change this folder. I think I should have permissions to have access to it. He will add himself into um, into the group or the role or, or whatever uh, definition I've created. And he's going to say, I just want to add Michael to the share. And then I will see the request. I will see the difference between what he had before and what is now. And I can approve it. And um, if I'm happy with it, I'm approved. Otherwise, I reject, I probably comment. And then we can see that he requested it. He made the change. I accepted the change. So we have accountability. We know when it's done. We have the documentation of the pull request or the commits ID. And he can tell me in those details why he's been requesting this and why he believe he has got change. So we have much better control of what's going on. It's not Michael just RDPing into a machine and making the change, and I don't know anything about it. So in terms of collaboration and documentation, this is a much better experience. Um, <laughs> and um, we can encourage, by doing this, so we can encourage small changes as well. It's, um, if, you, if you do this and you let people, even the smallest change can just be done by someone changing the path or changing a typo or a name, um, you can encourage small changes instead of doing, trying to get everything before a version is being released. So that's a, that's a concept of having a small batch instead of big batches of release on changes only happening every three weeks. Uh, you can do smaller, less risky changes to your system. And we can validate, and this is very important, we can validate each suggested change by uh, testing in a way that 
uh, gives us confidence in its release. You're probably using CI tools on automated testing, but if Michael makes that change, I can validate that it's not going to break any application without even before even I have a look at it. If it fails the build, then I will probably not even look at it until it fixes it. So let's be clear. All of those improvements and benefits are not specific to configuration management. You can get them in other ways, but you want to be able to apply those to um, configuration management. And someone wrote a white paper about this. So Michael and Steve Muraski, uh, they created this release pipeline model. I'll get out of the way. So the release pipeline model explained this. And, and this is not new. Uh, you wrote that in 2016, correct? Yeah, yeah. You, I was just you, thinking about that the other day. Like, I spent a little more than a year traveling around the world a couple times and presenting it. And uh, how long it's been since then? Yeah, because in 2017 you were at WinOps London and, um, yep. and you presented it at WinOps London. I remember that very well. And it's it's on YouTube if you want to find it. And and I've got I'm always thinking about this because that's the foundation of many other things, and I'm going to cover that in a bit. But it, it's been written four years ago, which seems like an eternity, uh, you know, from an IT perspective. Um, but if you do systems configuration, it, you will certainly need to go through um, this to improve your automation maturity. And, and really, I recommend you to read the white paper. If you're not managing oh. OSs anymore, if you are already on cloud services, containers, Kubernetes, you will notice that the management of those services are in evolution from, from this. It's coming from the same principles in there. There might be some slightly different approaches, like a GitOps may have a slightly nuance, I would say, in the, in the way they're doing this, but it's very much the same principle. So uh, if you learn this now, which I really recommend you do if you've done already, then you can transfer this into other type of systems and other architecture. It's still a very solid concept to learn. So, what happened to DSC? Um, and some people, when they ask the question, um, is so is DSC dead? Well, do we ask the same question? Like, is Windows dead? Are people <laughs> using physical virtual server? Oh, you know, we've got the cloud. Why? Why are you doing? This? So I suspect because everything's dead. Like the data centers have closed down because of public clouds. Uh, I don't think that's really happening. I would say that the key element there is if you have long living nodes and you want a relatively low admin to server ratio, you don't want to have uh, one sysadmin hugging every server on your company, then you probably need some configuration management. Uh, you've got different approaches to configuration management, but you probably want something. So um, if you're still managing long living nodes and you think you will most likely do it for the next I don't know, five years, 10 years, and um, then this, this approach, uh, this is what the recording live is about. So this approach <laughs> is, uh, is very relevant to you and the concept you can see is to translate to the newer systems. Um, there's many ways to do system automation and, and there's a spectrum of maturity. If you're just running scripts, well, it's better than RDPing into um, a machine on using the GUI to do something, right? But if you want to go further, then you will try to have some configuration management in this model as been uh, initiated by CFNG, Chef, and Puppet, and DSC, all of these. Um, and then if you do, if you go slightly further, you will probably have container management and then you get into Kubernetes, Opera services, and things like this. Um, any so if you manage servers you should probably get into this configuration management model and it's more mature approach than just scripting as an example so you can scale up a bit more it's easier for you to scale up it's easier for you to access the cloud it's not a lift and shift you actually reverse engineer to some extent what you already have and you uh, translate that into your configuration so you document at the same time what you have and uh, you can use, and it doesn't matter what tool you use, you can use Chef, Puppet, DSE, Ansible, Sol, CF Engine. I don't know, I'm, I'm probably missing a few, but uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyone who has some experience with any of those tool would say, regardless of the tool you start with, you should start now. Um, probably you should pick the one that you have the less friction 
uh, to start with, whether it's for organizational reasons, for cost reasons, in-house expertise, technology, just have a look now because that's probably going to help. And most, if not all of them, actually all of them, as far as I know, can leverage DSC and we'll, we'll uh, the DSC technology and we'll get into that in a bit more details. So just keep your mind open. When you start going for any of those, you're probably going to learn a lot and you're going to improve your process and you will probably want to try another one and change the one you're doing. So that's fine because you will have improved your process and it's not about the tool. It's not that much about the tool. It's a lot about the processes and the learnings you're doing, applying the right concepts, implying the release pipeline model as an example. And so regardless, you should get into the release pipeline model of this thing. So how does DSC relate to the other tools and solutions? Uh, sadly, we don't have time to dive into the different modes used by Chef Puppet and Ansible to compare with DSC, but, but there's a myth um, with DSC that exists only in two modes, push and pull, uh, which was true in WMF4, but changed since WMF5. So there's another way. Um, the, what is the push and pull first? So push is when you go tell the agent, this is the configuration you're looking for, make it so. So it's a weird cross between Star Trek and Star Wars. And the pull mode is you're telling your node, hey, go get the new configuration on this server every 15 minutes. So if there's a new version, download and apply it. And otherwise, just probably enforce the one you have if there's not no new one. So that's the difference between the pull and the push. And there's another way to do DSC or to consume DSC is invoke DSC resource. And um, many are using it without even knowing it, uh, and we'll get into this detail. But the idea is you can still use DSC as the technology uh, using invoke DSC resource. So it's not an agent, it's not the LCM, the local configuration manager, which is a Windows service. It's just a way to say, hey, you've got a resource. Use this resource to do something, to get set on test, and we'll get into that in slightly more detail. So if you want to, let's, let's go back a bit. So if you want to write your scripts, you, you've seen for ACLs, that's one of them. But if you want, say, to configure SQL Server, or if you want to install uh, SharePoint and configure SharePoint, all of these things is something you can automate yourself. And you probably ha will have to, to some extent. But if you look at um, the DSC resources online, they already provide a lot of features. So why would you rewrite this for you? Because it does what you want. Maybe maybe the DSC resource already do what you want. And, and one of the differences, if you start from scratch now and you reinvent the wheel, you will miss out on some of the things. And that's something I wanted to show you, which is um, the test coverage already for some of these resources. So if you see on this one, this is SQL Server DSC, just some unit tests. And you can see that they already have quite a few tests. And then that's just the files. So if you go inside one of those and you scroll down and you scroll down, I don't know if you see, there's a lot of tests already in there. So if you start writing now to get to the same level of maturity and quality into your script, you will have to spend a lot of time that people have done over many years actually on this one. And uh, people are maintaining that one. So that's why make sure you look first at the DSC resource and you consider, and this is the same for SharePoint DSC, and you consider looking at, at the resources existing there. So you can see there's also many, many, many tests. And those tests actually runs against different versions of SharePoint as well. So there's a lot of things going on there and testing to make sure it works. And actually the maintainer here, Eric, is a PFE for Microsoft Germany, I believe. So you see, it's also used by uh, Microsoft employees to work. So now that we've seen that, let's have a look at how you can use this Invoke DSC resource with Firestore 5.1, which probably you probably have everywhere. Well, I hope you don't have anything lower than that. But uh, and and we're gonna use the same use case, which is file access, uh, file system access role to uh, manage ACL. So I'm gonna show you that demo. So here I want to show you how Invoke DSC resource uh, looks like but first of all i want to show you the resource so this is the resource module and i want to show you to highlight that it's got um three functions every every 
um, every DSC resource follow the same format, the same pattern. You've got a get, a set, and a test, and you may have and use other functions, but in that case, um, you you always have the get, set, and test. And we've seen that uh, it's to manage the context, manage what it's got, and then to test if it has to do any change, and then the set to actually do the change. So I just wanted to um, review that. So this is the resource, but we don't need to edit it. I just wanted to show you how it looks like. And this is uh, the small script to use uh, consume that DSC resource into an imperative script. So like I would do in many other um, D, uh, mini PowerShell scripts, I just put my variables and my configuration data into those variables. And then I make sure I create the right hash table for my parameters so then I can use splatting to splat to the invoke DSC resource. So I will run this first. So uh, you will see, so this is just to create a variable. There's no issue there. And then you have a way to say, well, I want to use that DSC resource, which I defined the name and the module name. So I want to use that resource. And I want to call the method test. And I already set the properties there, which are here. So I want to set, I want to call the test and say, okay, am I compliant with um, this existing uh, information I've set? So if I run this, you will see that similar to when we try to apply the configuration, we have this issue because if you remember, I'm running as my normal account and I can't access the WMI service from this normal account, so I need to run this elevated. So the way of doing this is, uh, let me just go to my PowerShell, so that's for later. This is my PowerShell 5.1 PS version table. There we go. So I will do the same again. Oh, I forgot to copy the above. So the module is already installed. I put my, my data into my variable and now I can call functions. And in this case, I just want to run first the test. Is it, so is it compliant? And it's telling me true or the reason for that is I've already um, run the configuration before, so I'm going to clean up my environment. So I'm going to completely remove my test SEL for this demo. I don't really care about the configuration because I'm not using the configuration anymore. Actually, I will remove the configuration and the MOF file to make sure. So now I have an empty folder. So let's go back. And then if I run this again, Um, you can see that it's not compliant. It's not in the desired state. And it's unable to evaluate the access rules because the path doesn't exist. In this invocation that I showed you here, I am not uh, managing my context. So that's something I will have to do again. And that's not, uh, I can use the same principle and call the file DSC resource. But in this case, I will just quickly create um, that folder. So let's go back here and I will just quickly create um, the folder which is missing, which is this one. So now I will run the same thing again. Invoke DSC resource. And it doesn't complain anymore, but it tells me it's not in the desired state. So I need to set the SEL. And for that, I will just run this. So if it's not compliant, sorry. For hey, if it's not in the desired state, then run the set method. And it's the same parameter set. So you just give the same parameters. So I come here, I just copy that. The variables are already in, in my uh, session. When I run this, you can see it's the same principle, the LCM, and this is the problem um, when you're trying to run uh, with your normal user account and not your elevated then the else you can't communicate with the lcm the service on windows or with the within the wmf 5.1 and um, that is running this dsc resource and it tells you does it need a reboot uh, yes or no in that case you don't need the reboot so now if i run again my test it tells me it's in the de desired state because we applied with the set method and um, this is how you could use dsc and the existing resources from the gallery to apply it 
and uh, this way works and you have to run elevated when you run in um, when you run in PowerShell 5.1 and we'll see how it works later for uh, PowerShell 7. So as you've seen, um, this is a way to use the DSC resources within your um, within your imperative code. So within your script, you can reuse some part which is already done in the DSC resource. Uh, in that case, you've seen you can invoke the test first to see if you want to make the change, and then using the set method of that DSC resource to enforce and to add what you need. So you don't have to rewrite all the contents. You say, hey, this is the resource I want. And this is what I want to set. And then it's easier for you to just have to manage the parameters to it, which is the invoke DSC resource params here. So invoke DSC resource is there for you. The benefit of, of this, com this function is that you can leverage all the resources already in the gallery. And if you're not ready to make the jump to proper, I would say to full configuration management uh, solution, it's much easier for you to use this inside your scripts while not trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you've seen there's some downsides and some of the downsides that you need to set up WinRM. You need to make sure you have access to uh, WMI and, and a few things like this. Um, so you need to have some privilege to be able to run. And that is in 5.1. The way it works in PowerShell 7, we're going to see in a bit, is uh, different and you don't need that. The, the caveats is uh, you're missing the run as because it's going to run in your session in your PowerShell 7 session so you will have to make sure that session is running as the right user it's not going to be doing it for you but uh, at the same time troubleshooting is going to be easier because it's going to be in your uh, in your session and if you are using Chef, Puppet and Silver or other tools actually they're using underneath invoke DSC results uh, most likely at least and um, and Chef has the uh, DSC resource resource, DSC underscore resource resource. Puppet has the DSC and DSC Lite modules and they've got blog posts about it. Ansible has the Win DSC module. So all of those, they, they exist and then you can consume directly the DSC resources uh, that exist for uh, those configuration management tools. So feel free to just mix and match and whatever works for you. And you can write your own resources and then use them as well with Chef, Puppet, Ansible and, and so on. So even if you're using those commission management tools, you can leverage DSC technology. So think about it. If you don't want you, if you're not using any configuration management tool and you're just doing scripting, you can still use DSC resource as a technology. So keep an eye on it. And now we're gonna see how it works in PowerShell 7. And uh, I'm gonna show you a quick demo. So we've just seen how to do this with uh, PowerShell 5.1 and we've seen with the current user account that doesn't work does it's not a matter of the permissions of the folder the problem is accessing the LCM service which is uh, the service running as systems on the local machine so if I clean up this environment so I still have this so I will remove my test SEL and again I, on, I only care about uh, the invoke DSC resource so what I will do is I will still creating my test CL folder. So I've got the same state as it was before. I just created a brand new folder. I know I need to set the SELs. Um, if you remember, um, this session is as my user account in PowerShell 5.1. So I still want to use in my, I want to try in PowerShell 7. So I have an updated to 7.0.0 and I just have this version and it will tell me you have a new version that you should be updating so i will do a choco update uh, for powershell in a bit but at the moment i just leave that one it still works it's in actually preview for i believe the same so uh, let me go back to my folder src and then it's in psconf new 2020 and I've got my folder already that I just recreated on my, oops, sorry. Let's do it again. P oh, come on. It's for the recording. PS version table. There we go. Thank you. Predictive typing. And um, so I've got uh, this version 7.0, but it's still not running as admin. So what will happen if I try to do this? So again, I will run this. 
to put the uh, data, the configuration data into my variables, cleaning this one up. And then I just want to test first, make sure is it in the desired state or not. So I will run the test. And if you remember when we did that in 5.1, it wasn't working. And in this case, it actually just tells me false. Actually, there's an issue probably with a VS code for the display. Let's try it just again. Hey, it doesn't say anything now. Okay, let's do verbose. Just so a bit more text. There we are. It tells me uh, it was a display issue. Is it in desired state? False, which is what I expected. But that means it works even if I'm not running as an admin account. So from there, I can run the same thing I did before. I will, because it's not set, the first thing will be true and it says, and then it will run the set method. So let's run this. And again, I've got this output, uh, reboot required. So if I try to run now the test method, it will return. It will return, did I say? It will return, yeah, is it in desired state? And yes, true. So as you can see, this is slightly bugging the display and I'm not too sure if it's coming from VS Code or if it's coming from, um, from invoke DST resource in that case, but uh, that's definitely a, a little hiccup. So you go, PowerShell uh, invoke DST resource, as you can see the same, uh, this exactly the same code worked with PowerShell 5.1 and PowerShell 7.0.0 and, and onwards. And so you can keep consuming. So there's a bit of a caveat with this. And the first one is you need to make sure the resource that you're using is actually working with PowerShell 7. That's the first thing. And one of the that's the same thing when you try to script in one way in PowerShell 5, and you need to make sure that script will work in PowerShell 7. One of the reasons for that, and SCL is a very good example, the APIs that is used in .NET is not the same as the API in .NET Core. When you use get SCL and set SCL, it's actually the same thing. But uh, well, it works, it behaves the same way, but the underlying AP APIs are probably different, and in this case, are different. Uh, although I'm not going to go into the details. So that's one of the things. And you're not running anymore as the system because it's not running through the service, but it's running in your current session. So it depends on your session. And that means in DSC, there's a property which is uh, PS DSC run as credentials that one so when you want to when you want to uh, set another set of credentials to run a specific dsc when you do this you can do that uh, you can see the first one psdsc run as credential but that one when you do an invoke dsc results because it's not going through the service this one is not going to work so it's going to throw an exception on you so i just wanted to mention that and uh, la latest is if you're running invoke DST resource seven, so it's still an experimental feature. So in this case here, you have to enable, or you can see it's there actually, enable experimental feature name psdesire set configuration dot invoke DST resource. So it's still experimental because um, there's a few limitations that uh, we know about. And there's also a, a few bugs on Linux, um, which is something that uh, the team is aware of. You just have to tell Michael, um, who's hiding behind there, uh, that uh, you need you want those fixed. <laughs> Give feedback. <laughs> Michael is always listening to feedback, so yes. voice your yeah. what you want and your concerns. So am I saying we need to, you need to use a third party? Well, not at all. I'm saying actually the choice is yours. And I've mainly covered the ones that people must know about, I would say. But um, if you are on a in Azure, you still have Azure State Configuration. If you think you want to nail down the auditing first, then Azure Policy Guest Configuration that Michael is going to present uh, shortly after that is, is a very good candidate to do that. And uh, if you're on-prem and like you say, well, we're not allowed to do any cloud and that still happens in some organizations. And um, I have personally used DSC and with the version 5.1 successfully for, for several years. 
Uh, it doesn't have a pretty GUI dashboard. At the beginning, it's maybe a bit um, harder to get started, but um, Raymond Andre and Jan Hendrik Peters, two Microsoft PFEs, they have developed and extended like a great workshop around the way uh, we were using DSC and they've used with their customers as well. And that was inspired by what um, Chef and Puppet and some others are doing. Um, I will uh, I will share the links so maybe maybe later anyway. Um, oh, actually it's there. It's uh, the DSC community DSC community slash workshop uh, DSC workshop on GitHub, and you've got all the links and information about this workshop there. So, is DSC dead? No, DSC is not dead. Uh, the concepts are still very much relevant. The DSC the the DSC DSL the code constructs and the still used by solutions and third parties. Uh, VMware is investing into their vSphere DSC resources. Uh, PowerShell 7 invoked DSC resource uh, experimental feature is, uh, is there, is there for you to use and try. And if you have feedback, give it to Joey or give it to Michael. Um, and you have lots of existing DSC resources. They're ready to use uh, in 5.1 at least. And if you want to reuse them in seven, just make sure they works and give feedback to the maintainers as well. Uh, and there's a strong community and you can access the community. We're going to present the community in a bit, uh, but you can access them um, on Slack, the PowerShell Slack on the DSC channel. So what is that community I'm talking about? What does that mean? Well, when it started a long, long time ago, um, when DSC was released, <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, that was 2013. So DSC was released uh, with the D, uh, uh, Windows 2012 R2. And when yeah. DSC was released, the that's correct, right? Yeah, and we were publishing D, uh, community resources to TechIt. Oh, yeah, TechNet. Sorry, Tech, TechNet. Tech, yeah, TechNet, yeah. Yeah. Tech yeah. yeah, so at that time, <laughs> at that time, the PowerShell gallery didn't exist yet, obviously. Yeah. And uh, GitHub, I don't think GitHub existed, but uh, when it started, the uh, the DSC resources were not open sourced, but they were created by the PowerShell team because the PowerShell team wanted people to have something to use directly with DSC so then they can see the benefits of doing configuration management. But at the same time, if you give them just a framework like the DSC feature, but no resource to work with, it would be the, the learning curve would be very steep. So they said, well, we need to write some resources and, um, and then so people can start doing configurations of their Windows boxes. So this is why the PowerShell team started writing DSC results. And they published it on the 26th of December, 2013. And as you said, uh, that was not even published. So that was by waves. So I think it was every month. Yeah, that's so right. Every, yeah, so every month there was a new wave uh, being released um, uh, for the results kit. Um, so, in April 2015, the resource gate had moved to GitHub, uh, finally, probably because GitHub was getting more traction. So that means all these resources were open sourced and, and many people started contributing to those DSC resource. Um, and in June 2016, Katie uh, started to own the DSC resource kit and community uh, for the PowerShell team. Uh, she's been in charge of the DSC community calls, the DSC resource kit development. So the community was growing uh, behind Microsoft and leading uh, behind Katie. So here's a quick, uh, a quick uh, hello from Katie, who's uh, sent a video. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Kragenbrink, previously Katie Keim, also known as Quirky Cat on GitHub. I work on the guest configuration team previously the DSC team uh, at Microsoft. I started working on the DSC resource kit uh, in about early to mid 2016. And then I administered the entire DSC resource kit uh, until about August of last year when the community took over. It's been a long journey with the resource kit, answering lots of questions, figuring out how to test all of the resources, bringing on board uh, a lot of new maintainers. Uh, but it's been an absolute joy to see the resource kit and the community grow. And uh, as I might not be as involved as I once was with the resource kit, uh, but I hope to still be a channel between the DSC community and the engineering team at Microsoft. So after the resource kit was open source, the contributions increased. 
and the community matured. So the DSC community calls were working well. Some important questions were uh, solved, I would say, during the calls. Uh, like uh, changing the naming convention was a big one because it started, you know, with the X resource for experimental, C for community driven, so C name of the resource. So that was not working. And uh, during community calls, they discussed the, the matter and they find a solution to, okay, let's change it and just add the suffix uh, DSC to the resource. So now you've got SQL Server DSC for the, or SharePoint DSC, I'm doing as well. And, and also they, they uh, before that, they worked on an, a high quality resource module, the HQRM uh, policy, I would say, or, or standard to reach with the DSC resource module, how to get the best and the, the best quality out of the modules for people to use. And so one of the top contributors being there quite early, Daniel uh, from London, uh, New Zealand, and is still very involved. He was one of the contributors external to Microsoft. And since then, he's joined uh, the mothership uh, as a cloud solution architect. Uh, here's Daniel saying hi. Hi, I'm Dan Scott Rainsford. Uh, my first commit to the DSC resource kit happened in around September 2015. Uh, sometime in 2016, I was made a community maintainer for X Networking and then continued to pick up maintainer duties across several others. Uh, I also started creating and sharing my own DSC community resources, which I ended up transferring over to the DSC community later. Um, I currently maintain XPS desired state configuration, certificate DSC, storage DSC and computer management DSC, as well as several others. I'm also a DSC community committee member. My current contribution areas are in reviewing pull requests, answering questions, addressing issues, and adding new resource modules I maintain. I try to contribute to the shared DSC community tooling whenever time permits. Um, you can reach me by at mentioning me in a GitHub issue. You can uh, contact me on the DM on PowerShell, Slack, org, or through Twitter. Um, I'm really looking forward to continuing to support the community however I can. And in 2018, uh, one of the configuration team uh, separated from the PowerShell team, and the configuration team was working on guest configuration. So they started in 20, I think slightly before 2018. Um, and uh, they had some difficulty um, review all the contributions from the community and they're falling a bit behind the tool requests and the issues. So they contracted uh, Johan, uh, one of the top contributors of the DSC resource kit at the time, to help with ensuring quality and making sure the DSC resource was pushing forward. So here's uh, Johan saying hi. Hi, my name is Johan Jungre. In the beginning of 2016, I submitted my first commit to the DSC community. At the end of 2016, I was asked if I wanted to be a maintainer for one of the repositories. And from there I continued. I'm currently the maintainer of the repository SQL Server DSC and the XFailover cluster. I'm also a committee member of the DSC community. My contributions to the DSC community is helping users and contributors, making the resources, tooling and documentation better. I also help review pull requests submitted by contributors throughout the DSC community repositories. To reach me, you can tag me on the GitHub comment. You can also reach me through Slack or Twitter. I will see you around the community. And uh, about a year ago, seeing that the configuration team was uh, falling behind the community contributions, uh, and while Johan and Daniel were tied up with their full-time job, uh, they contracted me. Uh, I was not a contributor of the DSC resource kit, but I was active in the DSC community in other ways, and mostly I was available. And the question about solving the problem once and for all was raised and making sure Microsoft wasn't the bottleneck in releasing uh, uh, fixes and features. So we all had an idea which is making the DSC community more independent while keeping a high bar for quality and security. Uh, the maintainers were trusted, that was not a problem, but the partial GitHub organization limited the ways we could delegate some of the permissions to non-Microsoft employees. And um, the way the resource were released didn't really fit, so we had to change um, the way we released to be a bit faster, so we had to automate a bit more of it. And all of this has been discussed with the maintainers, and uh, we uh, started to channel all of this and transfer all the repositories, the, uh, the package in the gallery, and it's now under the DSC community. 
And what we created is we started to create the website and we're getting a bit more content into it, which is good. And then we created the DSC uh, GitHub organization. And we appointed um, those people that you've seen uh, as committee, uh, as the DSC community committee, the board, if you want to manage. So the idea is just, if we are a small team, we can make snappier decisions and it's easier for us to communicate between uh, Microsoft and the rest of the community. And so everything we do and we decide is discussed anywhere during the DSC community calls, which is open to anyone. And we also uh, use GitHub, um, GitHub issues to have some votes, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. And we talk a lot uh, during the DSC, uh, on the DSC channel on the Parachute Slack. So if you want to find out what's going on, feel free to go and ask over there or just browse the website. We usually got uh, all the information there. So we've been really busy actually the last uh, the last year or so. Um, the maintainers have the permissions to approve pull requests and they can also publish new versions. So we don't have to do it for them. So if today you raise a pull request and someone reviews it, the maintainer reviews it and approves it, you can merge it to the master branch and then that will create a preview release that is going straight to the gallery. As soon as he's happy with it and there's a build pass and he says, yeah, approve, merge, it goes to the gallery um, as a preview release. And then when he's happy that the preview release seems to be solving other problems, and if someone asks or if it's needed, he can just push a new tag to this um, to the master branch and that's going to create a full version release. So it's much quicker than just waiting for six weeks. And if you miss the gate, then you need to go to wait for the other So now, let's ask Michael what's coming up. If you want, hey. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Awesome. <clears throat> so I just wanted to go through uh, like what are the things we've been working on, and um, what can you expect to see next. Um, I think part of the like people asking what's going on with DSC is DSC dead that kind of thing is that really for the past couple of years a lot of our projects have been. Um, you know, pretty specific to Azure. And so uh, the first thing that we were tasked with, and this would have been about two months after we presented uh, the last time in person at PSConf EU, um, we were kind of given the direction that uh, at scale, large enterprises are really struggling with understanding the state of their compliance. So uh, is, is it possible as you move to the cloud to understand whether or not your machines uh, meet your requirements. And that's not just security. People hear compliance and they immediately think like security scanners and that kind of stuff. Uh, but there's way more to it than that. It's like you need to be able to verify that all of the agents that you would depend on are there, that uh, the correct software is installed other than agents and drivers and so forth. Um, you know, for, for specialized cloud workloads and things like that. Um, making sure that like certificates are in place and the correct people have access to the correct resources and all those types of things in addition to security rules. And then of course, many of those things roll up into regulatory standards that uh, enterprises are required to benchmark. So things like CIS and STIG and ISO and NIST and things like that. Uh, so that was the genesis for a project called Guest Configuration. Uh, we had already been planning on uh, sort of rebooting DSC into a new uh, platform, all written in native code, so it'd be very small, very fast. Uh, and guest configuration is 100% uh, live in Azure. So if you have VMs in Azure, uh, you can use Azure policy to audit what's happening in those machines. We've got a whole bunch of capabilities for Windows. Um, for Linux, we actually use Chef Inspect. Uh, but for Windows, everything is based on uh, desired state configuration. So if you um, go through our documentation, uh, just aka.ms slash gcpol, like guest configuration policy. Uh, you'll find how to use all of the built-ins because many people were finding, especially in this space, wants like a no-code solution. They just turn it on and they can go audit and see the state of their machines. Uh, but we also support you creating your own custom audit policies, which 100% is, is desired state configuration end-to-end. -end. So uh, all of the nuances and things like that are all documented 
as well if you scroll down under the how to section of azure policy uh, or you can go to aka.ms slash gc custom like guest config custom uh, and so uh, so to understand like the narrative of how guest configuration would be used, uh, imagine that you're a central operations team. Uh, this is actually pretty common in large enterprises who are moving to the cloud. Uh, it's, it's more than just the technical work of central operations, but like someone is responsible for handing out subscriptions to hundreds of developer teams. Uh, and they basically have no control over what those teams are going to do after the subscription is given out. So Azure policy was originally designed for things like, uh, let's make sure that when we store data, it stores, it stays within the physical regions uh, of data centers based on like privacy rules that we have to follow. Um, or maybe like, well, here's a project and we wanna make sure that this, uh, like no machines in this project ever have public IP addresses because we don't wanna have to worry about um, what ports are open and closed and things like that. Uh, so this extends that idea. And the idea is you might have requirements for things like, uh, are, are the correct things being audited in Windows? Um, or are user privileges uh, restricted based on least privilege across your organization based on some internal policies that you have? Um, or speaking of policies, things like group policy and password policy, like is it, uh, are, are all machines, even if they're not domain joined, handling things like the, you know, you can only use your last, or sorry, you can't use any of your last 10 passwords, uh, or you have to have a password length or complexity requirement. And as people start deploying more and more machines that are not domain joined, it becomes harder and harder to keep track of that. Uh, so the idea is the operations team can put this in place, you know, from the management group level, which would span all of the subscriptions in the enterprise, uh, all the way through, you know, down to individual projects. And, as the result of that assignment, as you see here, like you get feedback across all these application owners. The application owners can go in and say like, some of my machines look good. Maybe I've got just a couple that I need to update some small settings uh, to be compliant with my organizational requirements. Um, you may also have dev teams that have just like completely gone off on their own. Um, like I said, even beyond security with the things here, maybe they uh, like didn't install some software or they have, uh, they, they didn't take the organizational trusted certificate and add that to trusted roots on the machine, things like that that are more operational requirements. Uh, or you can look for things like, uh, we've had some really interesting customer requests that we've met, like, can you identify machines that have not been rebooted in more than input parameter number, number of days? Uh, specifically, they were looking for rogue machines because they hadn't been patched, no one's been working on them, they haven't been updated, they've just been running for like three months and uh, they're potentially a security vulnerability. So that could show up as a red X coming from one of those project teams just as well as something like a security vulnerability. And so a lot of customers have, uh, have been asking me, uh, it's great that you're doing this work in Azure and it's good that you're like pushing DSC forward, but that is very specific to machines that are hosted in Azure. And you know, we might have machines that are in our own data centers or in a colo or in AWS or in Google. And how do I take advantage of the work you're doing on DSC if I am not hosting my server in an Azure data center? <clears throat> so for the last year, uh, we have been working, uh, our team has been working as a piece of the Azure Arc team uh, to try to address this concern. And ARC is actually, I'm standing in front of the text, but uh, is actually like a suite of services that expands across data services, uh, 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 container platforms, but the specific scenario that we're most interested in here is ARC for servers. And this is the idea that this is unlike anything else that I know of, uh, that this is the idea that uh, whenever people deploy servers into the cloud, they have these nice, clean, like machines go into subscriptions and then resource groups, or they have metadata, like tags to say, who's the owner, what project is it in, and things like that. Uh, and that's when you compare, like that's really easy and everything can be controlled via the API in the cloud to, I, whenever I deploy in my data center, I might be running on physical machines or in Hyper-V on VMware. And it can be very difficult to track down who owns what. 
and understands uh, even what services each server is using to, to manage that node. Um, if you're looking across, you know, something like a spreadsheet where you've looked across a network scan to try to figure out uh, based on, you know, node name and things like that, uh, what, what, what you actually have as an inventory. It's very complicated, very difficult to do. So that's what the problem that we're trying to solve. And uh, the idea behind ARC is what we call projection. So in, in a projection scenario, you project that those nodes exist into Azure as a record. So the machine is moving to Azure and no information uh, is like, uh, uh, that's on the machine is moving to Azure. It's just creating a record that's saying this machine exists. It has a heartbeat to show that it's continually checking in. And uh, I think we collect like the IP address and the name, something like that, so that you can verify that it is who it says it is. Um, and it also provides some interesting capabilities, like inside the machine, there's a local REST endpoint, so that from inside the machine, you can see what all Azure knows about it. Um, you can see its tags. You can see you know, that the, the record is in a resource group. Um, you can get an authentication token if the machine has a, a computer identity. So it's a pretty well integrated solution, um, but we are just about to introduce some capabilities and I don't mind saying just about, uh, so because we're, we're getting pretty close now. Um, in fact, by the time this recording goes live, it might already be available, uh, where we bring the concept of machine extensions to ARC as well, just like what we have in Azure. So uh, you know, of the, extensions that will go to preview first, DSC is one of those. So the same way that if you're in Azure, you can actually deploy a machine and just assign a DSC configuration to it uh, as it's being deployed that gets run as it's being installed. Um, the same will be true for these ARC machines. So for people who are using Windows Pool Server, uh, you know, we made the announcements from blog posts that uh, we don't have any plans to further invest in the Cold server functionality that we shipped in server 2019. In server 2019, we added some features and then we were just super transparent. Like, we don't have plans to invest any further in Windows Pull Server uh, at this time, but it's supported for the next 10 years with the server 2019 release. And in fact, until it comes out of Windows, which we have no plans to do, uh, in every release of Windows, it just becomes supported for 10 years more. But uh, with DSC extension, you can just take your configuration, take your modules, uh, put them in a zip file that's anywhere that machine can reach, and then just uh, onboard the machine into ARC or put that in your image as the machine is being deployed. And then from a simple API call, you can deploy DSC configurations across machines outside of Azure. And when I say outside of Azure, that includes other clouds. Like these machines could be in AWS, they could be in Google Cloud, uh, they could be in a, a colo somewhere locally, uh, you know, that, this is within your geography. Uh, it could be you know, rack space, you name it. Uh, anything you can, any place where you can put a machine where uh, over an HTTPS proxy, it can reach uh, a private network or a public endpoint. Um, uh, as one of the Azure locations. So, so here's a screenshot of what it would look like if you've seen the Azure portal before. Uh, if I step here out of the way, you'll see that there's there's some machines here with the blue icons. Uh, these are actually machines that are running in Azure, and uh, those are hosted in a Microsoft data center. But then if we look up further, we should see these purple icons. This is getting kind of cheesy, like a weatherman uh, presentation. Uh, so those are machines that are running outside of Azure, and uh, they can be anywhere, just like I said. And uh, you know, since they have properties uh, like tags that we can use to identify them, I'll go on to the next screenshot. Uh, we can do things like Azure Policy to those as well. So if you want to keep track of machines need rebooted, they require certificates that are missing. Uh, you know, who's in the administrators group, what software is installed, things like that. You can actually get a complete picture of that and use all of the same management tools that you can use in the cloud across your data center. And it uh, doesn't even require you to host anything within your environment. Um, you just connect your machine into Azure and you can use the services from there. And then finally, since uh, many of you have seen things like Azure Automation before, uh, these become even that much easier to use. So we've thought about Azure Automation, desired state configuration in the past as being something that could be used where, you know, like the onboarding experience was basically 
here's a script that will help you configure local configuration manager to talk to the service in the cloud. And it was a very like do it yourself kind of approach to registration. Uh, now, all you have to do is take that ARC agent and I would just put it in the image that you're using to deploy machines so that when the machines get deployed, they just start showing up as resources. And now everything's just an API call. So you've got all kinds of flexibility and choices here. Uh, if you want to actually use Azure Automation to deliver and maintain the state of a machine over time, even if it's running in AWS, Google Cloud, or within VMware or Hyper-V in your local data center, it's still just one API call. You could use the PowerShell commandlets, you could use the Azure portal, you could use uh, the AZ CLI, like whatever you want to use to deploy uh, a, a, uh, an ARM template, um, just a JSON file that says deploy this extension for this machine. Um, any way that you can do an ARM deployment, uh, you could deploy a, an ARM template that includes map these extensions to my um, my, hybrid, my hybrid nodes, my ARC machines, uh, and you can onboard from there. And that includes other services that are in Azure Automation. So as an example, within Azure Automation, there's a patch management hosted solution where you could just from a browser completely manage the patch status of all your machines. That depends on the Microsoft Monitoring Agent, which is another solution that we're enabling via ARC. So the extension uh, starts to become pretty comprehensive. And finally, there is another service that I don't think we've presented for PSConf before, um, which is that you can take inventory of your machines and you can track how that inventory changes over time. So if you're really looking at configuration management as a comprehensive solution and more than just config as code, now you can use your config as code skill set, uh, build a ARM template that would go in and, I want to say ARM's Azure Resource Manager, it's the API for Azure, sorry, I didn't mean to use an abbreviation there. Um, then you can just do a deployment, onboard nodes no matter where they are, and take advantage of these services and management tools without having to host anything within your data center uh, and have that additional server expense. Thanks, Michael. So you're, uh, just I have a quick, I have a few questions around, around this. Um, so you're saying that from any VM, I can get those VM to be managed uh, through Azure even if they're running on my vSphere server. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the key change that I'd like to really point out this year. Uh, and people have been concerned about DSC and the new features of DSC being used only in Azure. And as ARC moves towards GA, and as we go through public preview of being able to use extensions, um, you'll really have new options for using DSC outside of Azure. And that includes a DSC extension as a way of just delivering configurations as you would with full server, uh, Azure automation for things like you know, really advanced reporting, and then the DSC v2 platform as part of Azure policy to do audits at scale. Uh, and we have a lot of plans in this area. I don't want to go too much and make promises, but uh, there's a lot of things we're looking at based on customer feedback where they feel blocked, um, where that there's you know, for one reason or another, they, they could never move a server out of their data center. Um, you know, we're basically just prioritizing based on how customers feel blocked, what we should go work on next. And uh, so you said, so you said guest configuration has some similarities with DSC. Can you expand a bit on how uh, the two relate? Because that's probably not yeah. clear for everyone. Yeah, great question. Uh, so. The way we, we look at this is even with these tools, you know, like um, for guest configuration, we didn't want to build a new platform that would have the potential of having a conflict with the uh, desired state configuration that shipped in Windows PowerShell. So what we do is take uh, a new engine that uh, provides the same type of functionality as local configuration manager in Windows. And when we load that as an extension on the machine, we actually take an instance of PowerShell core and we sideload that onto the machine under C program data. And then we take for, instead of having to worry about things like partial configurations or composite resource nesting and compiling a big, huge configuration, uh, we actually took customer feedback and for each configuration, it's a sign, which in this case is like different audit policies, because right now we're still in audit mode. Um, uh, each of those gets loaded into a separate subfolder. And so the Moth and each of the PowerShell modules that are required to support that all are sideloaded into an individual folder. And then we just manage each configuration independently. 
So that's, you know, for now it's audits. So it's like if you're auditing 10 things or 30 things, that's 30 different configurations. And we're doing that pretty regularly at the scale of millions of nodes. And uh, we're working through like the perform, like we're, we're, we have to live uh, under extremely uh, um, tight performance requirements. Like we are not allowed to have impact on these uh, machines as far as impacting the workload. Um, so like we take all that into account into our design. So that's why you know it takes a lot of time to figure out how to do things like 30 or 40 or 50 configurations, um, handling them all on the same machine. So it's pretty fascinating how we could definitely do a full hour just on like the interworkings of guest configuration. Uh, and so uh, this is something we're working diligently on. We've got a lot that we're doing in the next semester for guest config as well. Um, and we think we we think about DSC as the language abstraction that we have taken a hard dependency on. So, I was about um, so to we ask, don't have any plans to do something different. I was about to ask, so you're saying like your guest configuration package, it's, it's actually an artifact that you compile things together. So you said this contains a MOF. So you, how do you create that MOF? It's all DSC. So the authoring process is 100 dependent on DSC. Um, so on my workstation, I compile them off uh, just using um, PowerShell core on a Mac uh, because now with PowerShell 7, compilation is working. Um, we could go into that as a whole other hour. But, and, no, but, I just uh, wanted to make clear. Nice to there. Yeah. I just wanted to make yeah. clear that the, the process is very similar. So what, you, what when people use DSC already in 5.1, what they're doing is they're compiling artifacts and they're creating a MOF. And they're creating the packages that it's just zip files to some extent. So I wanted to make clear that guest configuration just follows the same principle. So you can still have your release pipeline model if you want and use that with yep. uh, guest configuration. But um, something else I wanted you to clarify is probably the last bit. Um, so you're compiling the MOF. That means you, if people is, are familiar with DSC, you have to provide uh, the data for that MOF. So you need to provide each information for each node. Do you? In most cases so far for audits, they've been more aligned to server role. So things like if you want to, um, uh, let me think, let me, let me actually uh, describe it this way. We, we've been able to move the specialization uh, to a different level of abstraction. So with DSC and Windows PowerShell, uh, after you produce that moth, it's static, right? There, there's no changes to it. Um, what we do with the agent and guest configuration is, let's say that you want to audit who's in the administrators group, and so you assign that to a scope of machines. It could be based on like where they're located in it. Uh, and so now you say, well, maybe I want to audit, uh, sorry, I, I want to check that who's in the administrators group is users Michael and Gail, right, and nobody else. That's being provided by Azure policy as part of the assignment that gets created. When the agent takes on that assignment, it takes that parameter and overwrites that field of the MOF file. So while the MOF file itself is still static, it's being overwritten on the fly with the parameter information coming from ARM. Uh, so we, as, as we move on into more and more scenarios, uh, that's an example of something that we've added that was never possible with DSC before. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, you bet. I believe, um, so if people want to find more information about, about this, well, what should they follow and where they should get this information? Yeah, I'm sure we can get these links posted up, but uh, just to make it super, super simple and easy, Go to aka.ms slash gcpol, like that guest configuration policy, gcpol. Uh, and I'll actually, put we. <laughs> I'll put it at the top above okay, the title, and then, comes, and then uh, we will be able to get there. And uh, we add something to those docs just about once a week. Like this is a, a solution that we're adding to all the time and uh, getting lots of customer feedback. So um, even if you have looked at those docs maybe six months ago, it might be worth going and taking another look now. Uh, and in fact, we have more changes coming um, just over the next month and uh, we hope to have even more changes by Ignite. So those docs are getting updated pretty often. So very last question. So DSC is not dead then? <laughs> 
I don't think so. No. So, uh, by the way, I have a philosophy on this. So, I, like, as part of my job, I talk to lots and lots of customers all the time. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, like, people are looking for, like, no-code solutions. Um, and maybe some of the more technical members of this audience um, have, have seen that as well within their own organizations, that, like, more and more people are wanting something that they can just turn on and make a pain go away. And uh, when I first started seeing this, I thought like, oh, this is a big change from what we were seeing whenever config as code first started. Like people must really be not wanting to like learn a new skill. And that turns out I was totally wrong about that after talking to more people. Uh, I actually think what's happening is that everyone is completely overwhelmed. So like everybody who's working in operations uh, is like trying to learn as many new skill sets as possible. They're trying to become multi-cloud. They're trying to optimize private cloud. They're uh, learning as many scripting and automation and operational tooling skills as possible. They're trying to figure out how to transition to becoming an SRE. And so in the back of their mind, probably at an unconscious level, they're just looking for things like, how do I take this off my plate? And I think there's more than just DSC. Like no one said, is, is the CMD file concept or BAT file in Windows, is that dead? Right, like we, we still use it. It's still a, a skill set that we have and depend on. Uh, we haven't really thought about that as basically just dead. But I think this concept of like when people say is it dead, they're they're saying two things. One, they're communicating to us we haven't seen you release anything for a while, or we don't like what you're releasing, and so they're trying to in a pretty you know dramatic way let us know that. And number two, they're they're like to themselves thinking is this something that I don't have to like be a, like a, a pulling on my brain, trying to, it's like one of the many things I have to keep up to date with, right? And they're just looking for, is it possible? So uh, hopefully what we're gonna be giving you, uh, you know, more and more of is the ability to, to use these solutions that you can just turn on um, and, you know, make your life easy. But we really want them to be extensible into any custom scenario and any custom requirements. And for Windows, desired state configuration is the language we depend on. So from our perspective, it's something we're investing in all the time. Perfect. Thank you. And um, I believe there will be a chat uh, this weekend. Otherwise, you can always find us on the Parachute Slack DSC channel. And even Michael is uh, there every now and then. So feel free to reach for us and if you have any questions, just ask. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks.